The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Wednesday. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and you. You know what sounds awesome out on that deck or patio, having a Cornhead Lager right now? Two hours uh, and 30 minutes. We'll probably be beelining to do so, but right now we can just hang out, talk a little football, a little hoops. Big night last night at CHI. Congrats to Creighton. Uh, rocking number one UConn. Our old buddy Jeff Motes was on hand there for that. So some Creighton reaction uh, to get into. We'll hear from Coach Mack. We'll hear from Ashworth, the Mr. Three-Point Man last night. Nebraska basketball. How many times do you hear it in sports from a coach, from an analyst? Do your job. You hear it in football, right? All the time, especially from a defensive coach. Sorry, you're not going to get many tackles. You're going to get the hell beat out of you for 60-plus plays. But, son, just set the edge. (laughs) Just set the edge with a guard and a tackle and a fullback coming down at you. Maybe a tight end holding you. But uh, do your job. Can Nebraska do their job tonight and do a job they haven't done since Manhattan, Kansas, before the new year? We'll talk about that. Uh, plenty of thoughts. Mike Babcock joining us from Hale Varsity and Heard at Sports. Evan Bland will talk uh, some Big Red with us as Husker baseball gets moving. And uh, Dr. Brandon Seifert, a jock doc. Baseball is in the air as Aaron Judge is going to have to deal with that, uh, that big piggy uh, much of the season. Numbers to get in, 489-1240, 489-1240, or 800-825-1240. 5865, where you can hear us across the Hale Varsity Radio Network. We encourage you to check us out on the YouTube channel, Hale Varsity YouTube. Subscribe and like, and the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at HVarsity Radio. Different platforms from many affiliates on the social channels that is Twitter and Facebook to stream us and catch a rewind of the show. Elijah, it is day number two for you of short sleeves. How's that bronze coming? Not well. Not no. well. I'm wearing short sleeves. This means I'm going outside. No, no. Um, I could really use it. Like, like the vitamin D really does make me feel better once the sun gets shining. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, not not just yet. Not on a weekday. Maybe this weekend. I'm trying to find a way to get out. I was hoping. And I, I sent out an exploratory text on Monday night and did not get the kind of response I was hoping for. Uh, crickets? For some pickup soccer. Oh, to, to get that rocking on Sunday. I don't know where we're going to play Where does at. pick up soccer fall? And we'll ask our friends at the stream. We'll do our, uh, our, our roll call, our starting five here in a moment. But I saw some folks the other day was headed to the grocery store. They were playing out at a park. It's like, okay, that's 11 on 11. There's some, some football. No, it was, it was Frisbee football. Frisbee going on. Yeah. Or no, Frisbee, uh, ultimate Frisbee? Yes. Oh, that's super fun to go play. I used to go play that back in high school. Shout okay. out to, uh, to Mr. Peters from Southeast. He had the ultimate Frisbee he was, club. He, he had just started when I was there. Yeah, so he, he had done, uh, whenever I was there, the ultimate Frisbee club. He'd always come bring his dog, and his dog would just sit and watch. And That's the old... ultimate weapon. <laughs> oh, no, and it, it was always, like, really humbling as a, a high schooler. I wasn't the most athletic high schooler. Like, I was an offensive lineman. It's not like I liked running all that much. I, w- I, would, I would paint yourself a little bit better. I played left tackle in high school. I was the athletic lineman. It's still not as athletic as well. That that's what I was getting to. Is there's nothing more humbling than a, a middle aged man playing ultimate frisbee, just running circles around you just and killing just, you. Like it's kind of like the the old man playing pickup basketball at the YMCA, <laughs> where it doesn't look like he's trying that hard, but he's cooking you. Oh, you know? big time. Yeah, that that was Mr. Peters playing ultimate frisbee. Big big fan of ultimate frisbee. It's hard to get at this age in my life enough people together. Whereas with with pickup soccer, you have some other different variations of the game you can play you got world cup do you have the you can have the chain smoker do you have the chain smoker and pick up soccer like you do and pick up basketball um depends where and who you play with what i what i mean though is you you know someone's in there you're guarding him and you know he had just five heaters before he went in to go school you up and down the court the bigger one that i think you run into literally 
is like the bigger guy that you could tell that was really good at soccer back in the day. Um, that is now like barely moving, but just the littlest little skill move. And he has passed you and you're just super embarrassed because you should be out athleting him. That's the one you run into a little bit more. I guess you probably occasionally get the, the cigarette smoker, but the difference in soccer and basketball is that you're not usually up in somebody's grill like that, where you can still smell their breath. You know, there's a little more space in soccer. So you can't really tell you have people by you. You, you smell the, uh, the aroma of Marlboro. You have people that look like maybe they ripped a heater before it, but you can never, you you never for sure. They're the ones bent over at the knees, not because they're 47. (laughs) It's because they are coughing uncontrollably. Uh, pretty good story here from uh, 24 seven sports. And uh, instant impact players. What freshmen, what true freshmen in 2024 are poised to uh, make a contribution right away? You guessed it. Dylan Raiola up there on the list. We'll talk about that. But uh, let's get the roll call going. Our starting five. Mike Corgan checks in uh, as Mike in at number one. Jeff, number two. Brennan from the Black Hills, three. A new name, KP Welcome, KP 300. In at four, the artist formerly known as KG Kids for Life. He has had a stretch, a string, and we'll start calling him Joe DiMaggio. He's got the hit streak going. Jim is in at six. Brandon, thanks for checking in. Roger in. Weston back in. Eat Beef is there, and our friend Montana Husker is in. Good to, good to hang out with you, Montana Husker. I see Productions uh, 135. Shout out to you and Tiger Shark Diver. Uh, Tiger Shark has been hilarious with some of his comments. Uh, Brando Sports World. Walter is in from Philly. Uh, So there we have it. Uh, We'll get to more of your comments. Roger, you're too kind. Best hats off. All pa- uh, uh, hold on here. Best hats of all podcasts. Okay, thank you. We we do have we have a pretty good hat game. I have the one that my dad gave me, uh, or I took from him, and. uh, that's that's what I wear. You wear that one a lot. You also have the one that I've seen you wear of the. Uh, it's got the golf cart on the. Yeah, front. I, I wore that last night at the gym. Yeah, that's a good one. I got this Nebraska one. I got the Broncos one. Yeah, we we I've have. I've got a, a, a hat game. Brooklyn Dodgers hat. Old school throwback Jackie Robinson, that I think game my worn? wife. No, no <laughs> not game worn, but my wife has it somewhere because apparently it's too nasty and messy and smelly for for me to to wear in public so it's been confiscated i do need to take i promised our friends at the bar the bar and they have such a cool setup behind their bar different folks who've signed you know parts uh, of of the bar the bar or different parts of just different memorabilia they've got their wall of fame you know with pictures of, of groups over the years that have attended uh, and I, I am gifting them. Uh, um, Carson has the Mississippi State hat Coach Leach sent us. Oh, wow. So Monkey Jr. has the, the Leach Mississippi State hat, and he has that hanging up on his wall, and he'll, he'll wear it during the summertime. But back, back in the day, Pirate sent me... <laughs> Uh, he sent me uh, a zip up, a Washington State, but I think it was from the women's golf team. I didn't complain, but it's just, a, but it's just a little bit snug on me. But he sent me uh, a Washington State Cougars hat. I need to deliver that to, to Seth and Gregor's because they want to. I want to put it behind the bar for mm. the pirate next to uh, a picture of him with the eye patch on. Oh, that'd be pretty good. So you know, it's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty cool. We'll dive into some hoops here. Let's start with Creighton before we get to Nebraska. Don't boo us in the stream because it's impressive when you take down number one. Coach McDermott last night after the win, it was wow. I was uh, huffing away on the treadmill watching it. Many of you went or, or checked in on it, and it looked a little bleak early for Creighton. They got hot, Ashworth especially, from three-point land, and uh, Creighton ran away with it. They looked impressive they're up to a three seed now and a lot of seeding projections here's coach mac it's really a culmination of a lot of work by a lot of people uh over over a long period of time to give these guys the opportunity to to wear this uniform and play in front of the crowd we were able to play in front of tonight i just couldn't be more proud of them so you had the court storming you had an exuberant chi and you have omaha feel what PBA's delivered a couple of times this year mm-hmm. with the win over 
excuse me, Purdue in the win over Wisconsin. And, you know, UConn's one of those teams. You talk to Jays fans. I've got a couple of friends that, that went to Creighton. And, I mean, UConn's one of those teams you marvel at because of how physical and gifted they are. I mean, they, they play old-school Big East basketball in the days of Alonzo Mourning and Patrick Ewing where they truly do beat the hell out of you on both ends of the court. Super impressed with Creighton's physicality, impressed with Creighton's game plan, and they were always making the extra pass. They are able to beat the rotation, and they banged. I mean, they, they were tough down low. Kalkbrenner and company. Kalkbrenner really impressed me. He did. Right? He, was, he was fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, Alexander was money. And even though Baylor kind of put his, uh, his, his distribution hat on early, he was held uh, to minimal points, just two points. But he had about a seven-point run in him when things got a little close, about a ten-point difference in that second half when UConn was inching back. Uh, but Byerman, uh, but uh, Shireman rather uh, was able to hit a mid range, hit a three, and then find a teammate. So super impressive. They go to St. John's next. You know, Slick Rick's waiting and lie because there's so many teams right now, Elijah. That the, the time is now to make a move off the bubble. Indiana's one of those teams tonight for Nebraska. Minnesota's absolutely one of those teams. So Nebraska's got a couple of elimination games looming right now. Uh, Iowa did uh, did Nebraska solid. I I don't think there's any way Michigan State gets kept out of the tournament, but it's it's a little disconcerting if you're a Nebraska fan to see Michigan State in the tournament. I know their schedule was murder, but they didn't beat anybody uh, really. And it, to be honest with you, uh, in their non-conference, despite how hard that schedule was, yet they've been not only seated above Nebraska, they're listed in the tournament by most projections as a team that's that's safely in while nebraska and northwestern two teams that have beat sparty they're uh, they're still fighting for their tournament lives in the on the bubble or last four in or or first eight in so to speak well nebraska's got a, a huge opportunity tonight i don't think it can pull them off of the bubble but it can put them more safely in the implied odds in vegas right now uh, with Nebraska's odds to make the tourney. Nebraska is minus money to make the tourney. The implied odds have them around 70% odds to make the tourney as it currently stands. So take that as you will. I think you can get that up a little bit tonight with Indiana. But back to the Creighton game. Um, you talk about, about movers making moves. In a different note, not in terms of the NCAA tournament, I think somebody needs to tell Ohio State that yesterday's price is not today's price with, with Coach Mack. Just went up a million dollars a year. <laughs> He's just got the first number one win I, in program I history. Ohio State price just went up. That's that's <laughs> so good. That's a good take. That is a good take. And you know he is he is the king of Omaha, deservedly so. He's not only recruited, but he's he's shifted leagues to a power basketball league that is deep and super talented. And he's always in that top two, top three, top four. It's been a long time since we've talked to Coach Mack, but he's always been gracious to us when we've reached out. And you love what what he's got going with his program. A guy that fans don't like, back to the UConn factor, oh, is Hurley. is 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 Danny Hurley, and and he's the whole always Hurley family. Well, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> One he went to Duke. I'm talking Bobby, but but Bobby went to Duke, and he was that snot point guard that just found a way. I respected the heck out of Hurley. Never liked Hurley at Duke. But he was, he was good. They took down UNLV, made me weep uh, one time as a teenager. And uh, Daddy Hurley was, was ready to, to lose it last night. And he's always working the refs. He's, uh, he's tough to, to watch and take on the sideline. He's great, though, as a coach. And that program as a UConn uh, basketball juggernaut has continued to endure. Doesn't matter who the coach is. Uh, it kind of does, but point is is what Calhoun built is still strong here's Hurley after the loss we've been on a obviously we've had a great run and and uh but it just kind of felt like today I uh, just ran into uh you know them them playing great and and us not playing as well as we need to uh versus them you know here in Omaha you haven't lost in two plus months and this doesn't happen to us very often so yeah I mean we were yeah we were, we were definitely stunned um, this wasn't the game we expected we, ex- we knew this was a dangerous game and a quality opponent and one of the better teams in the country but we, we, ex- we didn't expect this to happen well Herdizel said it right echoing <laughs> a 
what uh, what what Elijah tweeted last night. Nebraska, the state where number one goes to die. How about that as the new state motto? Not just Nebraska nice, not just the good life. Number one goes to die. If only it would translate to sports that weren't basketball. That'd be great. Yeah. I'd love to see that. (laughs) (laughs) Might be a little bit too narrow (laughs) to be on billboards uh, or billboards that that aren't around uh, major arenas. Anonymous is not happy. We are discussing the undiscussable. Number one goes down. You got to talk about it. Uh, yeah, and, 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 Anonymous and, also says if Creighton goes, uh, finds a new coach and goes nine and twenty-two every year from now on out, that will be uh, nine wins years, nine wins a year too many. His, so his final comment's the one that's really off the top rope, though. Yeah. My view on Creighton versus UConn is the same as Henry Kissinger's view of the Iran Iraq War. It's a shame both couldn't lose. <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's yeah. something right Anonymous there. Anonymous doesn't own anything blue in his closet nor is there a a blue jay lid uh point noted mike babcock is grinning in the uh, the green room we will check in with babbers get to some husker basketball some husker football thoughts you can email the show chris at hailvarsity.com what time are you having a cornhead lager today with this uh, warm weather chris at hailvarsity.com wednesday with you here on a hail varsity episode Empowered by Cornhead Lager. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out. It's Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark is in tomorrow. Habit, sorry. Mike Babcock with us. With Hale Varsity and Herdad Sports. Get uh, Babber's uh, bi-weekly newsletter, Mike B at HerdAdSports.com is where you can email to get that. Mike, we'll get into some football, but are you wearing candy-striped warm-ups as you do this interview here on the Hale Varsity YouTube channel? I am not. You don't own any, do you? I wouldn't do it. Okay. It, 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 just saying. Just saying. <laughs> What, what, what Mike Babcock is wearing during this is the Grateful Dead hat. And I got to add, I was listening to uh, the Grateful Dead. They got their two albums they dropped from their live performances out at Folsom Field from last summer now. I was listening to that at the gym last night. Never thought the Grateful Dead would be good gym music, but it worked out for me last night. It's Great gym music. Eh, well, it, were, it worked well. I'd never tried it before. Mm-hmm. L- last night was a first. I've run out of Lord of the Rings audiobooks to listen to at the gym. It's a shame. Which, that's great at the gym. But I was surprised. Grateful Dead, it worked as gym music. You could get some uh, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. That would be good workout music. If you could find it. Noted. Uh, We will take notes on that. Babbers, uh, if you were to give me a Grateful Dead song title to represent this Nebraska basketball team. Ooh, that's a good question. The the home and the road uh, adventure that is. What comes to mind? Built to Uh, last? Yes or no? What was that? What, what did you suggest? It said built to last. Is this is this Fred team built to last? Built to last? Um, I think it would be no, no trucking. I think it would be okay. Just, uh, just lately trucking. It occurs to me what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> 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 that that is it. That that's what this season's been because of the home and the road split. Well, yeah. <laughs> There, there's one. Yeah, that's why the Huskers are are. Uh, you were talking about them being on the bubble. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's the you know why is that? That's the answer to the question. You're eight and zero at home in the conference, and you're zero and seven on the road. Um, you need to get some, and you've got opportunity now tonight, Indiana, and then um, you've got road games at Ohio State and Michigan, both of whom are below Nebraska in the Big Ten standings. So. If you can hold serve at home and get a couple of wins on the road, I think you put yourself in a much better position uh, to, to, to be off that bubble and where you deserve to be, I think, with this team. But you've got to win on the road. How about this for a deep cut? And I just know this because it came up last night as I was at the gym. Going down the road feeling bad. Bit of a deeper cut from the dead, but I think that might be the perfect song to represent the road struggles. Yes, I like that one too. That's a good one. 
You don't get any of these road wins. It turns into me and my uncle. <laughs> Where you get dumped in Mexico, left for dead. Uh, so, I listen, maybe I'm in the minority. I think they got to win out. I think they got to win out to make sure they don't have to do any extra lifting in Indy. And I say that just because of what you touched on, Mike. You're You're ahead of most of your remaining opponents. Now, you don't have that no sit Sunday opportunity with a, with a one, two, or three seed coming in. You've handled your business there. Andy Markowski nailed the point last night saying you've beaten everybody that's in front of you. So your your your, your wins in league are not beaten up on, on the Michigans of the world. You've beaten teams that are squarely in the field and, and a number one seed overall. And until they faded, a two seed in Wisconsin and almost, again, the almost – that's been Nebraska's story, not only with Illinois, but with Rutgers earlier this year, and also uh, the uh, the Minnesota game. I mean, th- there could be three more road wins for this team, and we're talking about a second, third, maybe fourth place spot. You can still get into that top four. But with Nebraska right now, I think they win out because I think any loss, home or away, submarines them to maybe the play-in, and if you lose two – then you're probably on the bubble, and you got to go win two in Indy. That that's my math, and maybe I'm wrong with it here. We'll see come March 17th. But I, I mean, they're too good a team to me to to not be in. But yet they're they're still playing with fire. Yeah, I, well, I agree with that. And if they went out, I mean, if they went out, they have the potential to finish in the top four. In the yes, top two. depend on how things go, obviously. But they're in a position where that happens if they if they went out. But um, I don't know. I don't know if they if if they can get on a roll and win out when they have had so many problems on the road to this point. And three of these last five games are on the road. Um, we have to see a different team show up in those games and again maintain home court. Well, and one of the things we kind of talked about yesterday on the show, we can glean some information from the selection committee by their their top 16 that they released over the weekend. What they really seemed to value more than anything was teams with a good strength of schedule with quad one wins that that means something. And Nebraska, as it currently stands, has one potential quad one game remaining at Ohio State. That, as it stands right now, would be a quad one game. You're at three and six in quad one. Four and six, I think, would look really, really good to the selection committee. And aside from that, you have to stay above 500 in quad two. You're at three and two right now in your quad two games. And you have uh, one coming up tonight against Indiana. And then you have that road game against Michigan. Still technically a a quad two win. Both of those very winnable games, in my estimation, as it stands. Obviously, you have the road juju that doesn't look good. But you're still perfect in quad three. You're still perfect in quad four. Your quad three games coming up home against Minnesota, home against Rutgers. With how well Nebraska's been playing at home, you don't want to chalk those up as wins, but you feel pretty good about them. It comes down to a couple games to me. Like, Ohio State winning that game on the road would be huge given their current ranking. And then you'd like to stay above 500, which means you at least need to go 1-1 one and one against Indiana and Michigan in those two games. And then get your home games, I think you're in. You, you lose to Michigan, it damages you horribly. Indiana's been on the wrong kind of bender, all right? And, and they are gettable. Uh, you, Rutgers, you, you'll get credit for. And thank God you get them here. It ain't going to be easy. Same with Minnesota. Minnesota's pesky. They're playing really good basketball. That'll be tough. And Ohio State, I mean, they, they've got a little breath of life in them with uh, taking down Purdue. So it, it is not easy. And when I say win out, I mean, that's very improbable. But that is the, the, the least sweating you can do. Mike, uh, I want to go to, to Nebraska football here for a moment. We're not far away from from spring ball and 24 7 sports national put out some impact freshmen and i want to get your thoughts here matt rule's been really clear a couple of times he's talked and been asked about uh, dylan riola and and he's not gonna rush things he's not gonna uh overwhelm him at least that's that's the idea yes use the talent put the competition together for the for the quarterback job in the spring and then let's see what carries over. But above all, uh, he needs him to just 
be a, be another quarterback, not this five star ballyhooed program changer. What do you think is is a fair expectation here as we look at the spring for Raiola and moving forward here? Because he's he's up there. You you don't often get a talent like this to come in. Yeah, he he is up there, and I think he remains the the quarterback that has all the attention, whatever rule tries to do, however he tries to approach it. And I hope he does, you know, level out the, the, the uh, snaps between Harburg and Kalen and Riola. But I think that still, uh, I, I think Riola is going to emerge as the quarterback. Mm-hmm. I think that it, you know, if, if he doesn't, it, it just has an impact that has nothing to do with the with the program and rule and whatever. It's the outside perception, if that makes any sense. It's like, wait a minute, you got this five star, or is it? Have they changed that now? Is he four star? I think he's he's still he's still a five star. He's still five star. Okay, so you get this five star quarterback. He comes in and he doesn't win the job. You know what 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 does that mean? You got a hell of a cupboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and in terms of pressure on whoever was the one that finished ahead of him, would increase too because people are looking at the social media age, the pressure that's going to come from that, and we've seen it a bit of pressure on Raiola, I suppose. Um, but I think he's going to emerge as the guy. I, you know, if he's the talent that we think he is, and there's no reason to believe that he isn't, um, then if the reps are equal, he's going to step up and show that he's the guy and he's going to emerge as, as the, uh, as the number one guy. That's just my perception. You know, Kalen's a freshman too. So, and Harburg really hasn't had that much experience. He's got what, eight starts. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's my expectation coming out of the spring, but from my point of view, I hope that the quarterbacks get equal opportunity to show what they can do. And I think that that's what Rule indicated in, in, in his uh, news conference. Mike, does does Dylan have pressure on him this spring? Well, I think he does, but, you know, he's he's dealt with pressure, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, transferring as he did to the different high schools to play his high school career and then the, uh, um, you know, the commitment and then the changes his mind. Um, I, I think that's all pressure, but I think that he's probably at the point where he's able to deal with that pressure because he's dealt with it from the time he started playing high school football and got on the field and was the, was the man. So I think that he, I think he can deal with the pressure. I, you know, um, that's just my sense, but uh, given the family connections and everything, I, I think he can deal with the pressure. I, that's not a concern for me. Mike, you're about uh, 45 seconds. What's coming up from you in the newsletter, bud? Well, um, I'm working on a, uh, you know, uh, Fred Hare, who I think was the best high school player I ever saw. I'm working on a newsletter there to finish out Black History Month. Awesome. Um, fabulous Fred Hare. And okay. He had a had a remarkable shot against Michigan. Uh, number one team. And uh, he hit that shot at the buzzer to, to win the game. That's, that's big. That's kind of my uh, fabulous Fred. Love it. Mike Babcock with Hale Varsity and Heard at Sports at MD Babs. Find him, follow him on Twitter. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Good to get caught up, bud. Thanks for having me, guys. There he is. Mike Babcock with us. We'll hear from Fred Hoiberg. Open phones till 5 coming up here on Hale Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time at Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Logger, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We'll dive into a uh, topic in the 5 o'clock hour about uh, Big Ten football and uh, who is going to be king of the Big Ten. Uh, who are the candidates to be 
playoff worthy, playoff contention with this new expansion. We'll get there. Evan Bland with us in about 20 minutes or so. Husker basketball trying to uh, break on through and get to that first win in Big Ten road action at Indiana. Fred Hoiberg yesterday sets the scene for a trip to a pretty iconic gym, but uh, what's different now? I mean, and the reality is you have two different teams. Indiana's been hot and cold, but they can explode uh, at any moment. They're that athletic. They're that talented. Can Nebraska do something they haven't done before? Here's Fred. Listen, it's that game seemed like uh, like a year ago. With uh, I think that was one of the December games, and obviously we're both different teams at, at this point of the season. And you know, one thing I really liked about that game was our movement. I thought we had really good uh, movement on the offensive end, and you know, we had good activity on the other end of the floor. They exposed us on some things as well. You know, I'm sure we're uh, obviously both going to make adjustments going into this one. And uh, just the biggest thing for us, obviously, is, is going out there and playing with great effort for 40 minutes. And we struggled with that on the road. When, when adversity has hit us, we have not handled it well. And it doesn't take much on the road when you're going through that type of stretch, uh, you know, to put yourself in a big hole. And it takes a lot of energy to dig out of it. And we just need to go out and play a consistent 40 minutes of basketball. I, I like how our guys are playing right now. I thought we had two really good uh, performances at home. And we, uh, we did some good things on both ends, coming off probably our best defensive performance of the season. And Indiana will pose a lot of different challenges than a lot of teams in this league. They're a very paint-centric team and do a really good job of getting uh, Renew and, and Ware, uh, put them in good spots on the floor to take advantage of their size uh, and, and their length. So, you know, for us, we're going to have to go out and, and hopefully get off to a great start. Uh, it's one of the greatest venues and, and home courts in uh, in the country. And, uh, and again, it's going to take a complete 40 minutes if, if we're going to flip the narrative of our road struggles and, and try to go out there and get a big win. So some thoughts on tonight. We'll hear a little bit more from Fred in a moment. But we think back to December, Elijah, and that win really, I think, jolted Nebraska into a a good place. You had a couple of four-star, high four-star dudes come in from Indiana, and Nebraska figured them out defensively after all the lobs to the rim and some early dunk contest uh, showings by Indiana. And what did Nebraska do? They buckled down defensively, forced 19 Indiana turnovers. Uh, 15 of those were Nebraska steals. Uh, Indiana, not great at three-point shooting. To stop me if you've heard this before, where Nebraska goes on the road against a bad three-point shooting team, what happens? Well, at Rutgers and at Minnesota, they go off at their home gym from the three-point line. So Nebraska's got to be good on their end from three-point land for sure. But then they've got to be uh, good around the perimeter. And then get some of those big dudes. You're not going to make a living at the rim tonight, but guess what? Get to the rim, get fouled, hit some free throws. Nebraska was really good from the free throw line the first time against Indiana. I don't know what ref show they're going to get tonight on BTN uh, for Nebraska-Indiana. So time will tell with that. But those are some thoughts uh, early and, on here with tonight's tip-off. And another question I have specifically with this Indiana team is what kind of pride factor do they have at this have point? Have they punted team? or not? That's the question to me because they're not at a place where they they can realistically play their way into the NCAA tournament unless they have some sort of miracle run to end the season into the Big Ten tournament. You look at their last two home games, they've lost them both. Northwestern beat them by four uh, just a couple of days ago on Sunday. And then you have a, a game against Penn State from uh, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, where uh, Penn State goes into Bloomington Assembly Hall and beats them 85-71. to 71. They've lost three of their last four games. That's the question to me with this Indiana team. Have they rolled over, or do they have pride of protecting their home floor and, and ending the season the way they want to? Because it could go either direction, and I think Nebraska, this game tonight, is the biggest indicator for how the rest of their season is going to go. How much pride does this Indiana squad have? Are they going to go out fighting, or are they going to roll over to end their season? If, if they're going to roll over... I think Nebraska stands a really, it. really good chance of winning this basketball game tonight. The Indiana team's got talent, but if they don't have the effort, Nebraska should be able to go beat them. If they're playing for pride, if they don't want to turn a two-game home losing streak into three, I get really, really worried about Nebraska with their road woes. But it's uh, it's a toss-up in my mind tonight, and it kind of comes down 
less about Nebraska, despite all their road struggles, and more about Indiana. How much do they still have to play for? And Vegas agrees with me with that toss-up. I think the line right now is Nebraska favored by one and a half. They're favored? I thought Indiana was favored by one and a half. Did it flip? I believe, when I checked last night, Nebraska was favored by one and a half. Okay. So wow, uh, that's, that's still pretty, <laughs> that tells you the state of Indiana. <laughs> that's pretty close to a toss up, but yeah, and it's it's kind of the question in my mind is is Indiana just done with this season? It's, it's with the talent they've had. It's been a really really disappointing year. They've had, taken a couple of rough losses within the past couple of weeks. Are they just done in the season? That's the question to me tonight. Well, are they going to fight for their coach or not? Dan Dockich has been killing him. He's back on the air middays uh, out of Indianapolis. And he's a, a Bob Knight Hoosier, and he's just been bludgeoning this team, this coach, with, with his uh, statewide radio show. I mean, how much are they listen to him? Do, do they uh, do they care anymore? Are they all ready to move on? Well, Indiana minus two and a half. Uh, Danny checks in. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I am also looking at their stretch to close the season. Realistically, this Indiana team could lose out. Sure. They got. I mean, it's Nebraska now, and then you have Penn State. Penn State just beat them. At Assembly Hall, then you got Wisconsin, then you got Maryland, then you got Minnesota, then you got Michigan State. That's brutal. Like you have a brutal stretch to the season here. I don't think it's out of the question that Indiana just rolls over and looks at all these opponents and says, "Nah, nah, we're on to next year." I guess well, we'll, we'll find out tonight, though. Let's, uh, if we can, squeeze in the uh, the elephant in the room, and that is the the road losses. Uh, Hoiberg was asked yesterday, "Do you guys talk about it?" Well, we talk about it. We talk about what we have to do in, in order to come out on top. And we've had three close, uh, good opportunities to win, and, and we've got it handed to us a couple times as well. We've got three more chances on the road, starting with this one tomorrow night, and it's it's going to take consistent basketball on both ends of the floor. Um, you know, when you look at this, Ohio State's coming off their best game of the season, knocking off Purdue, and Michigan is a completely different team at home with McDaniel playing. So we got three really tough challenges ahead of us and it starts tomorrow night and if you don't play 40 minutes of consistent basketball in this league on the road you're not going to win it's as simple as that and you know it's going to be us uh you don't have 15,000 behind you uh you know the 15 guys that are traveling the coaches you know the few fans that will have in attendance but we're all we got when we go on the road and we have to handle it better than what we've done the uh the first couple months we're all we got (laughs) there's a few uh Folks uh, th- that may make their way into Assembly Hall, but yeah, it's going to be a, a uh, lion's den tonight. We'll see if the crowd has more roar than the Hoosiers. And I'm also seeing, I'm looking through the different lines. I am seeing this everywhere from Nebraska favored by a point and a half to Indiana favored by two. I'm seeing it all over the place. Caesars has it as a pick em. Like, there's no consistency with the betting line. kind of depends on where you go to get the, to get the line, but... <laughs> It, Should be an interesting over. steak and a beer around five fifty. It will be. Well, I, we'll just call it a pick 'em. Yeah, call sure. it a pick 'em. With I, I mean, I see so much variance in this line. I think we just call it a pick 'em for now. All right. Well, and what we will pick at five fifty. Evan Bland shortly will wind down hour one. Hail Varsity with you on a Wednesday. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. And now, and now back to Hail Varsity Radio. A college football update. Uh, you have the college football playoff commissioners meeting today. That included a discussion of crowing the field to 14 or more in 2026 and beyond. Uh, you got to chase that paycheck and those rights. So is bigger, better, and more money. Uh, we'll see how big this thing grows to. But uh, a tweet here from Nicole Arbach. With the Athletic and BTN, the bracket size of 14 or bigger discussed at the playoff meeting, as well as multiple bids for some leagues. Everything's on the table. No final decisions yet. We'll talk with Coach Barnett tomorrow, get his take on what's ideal. But uh, you have a bigger playoff field. Maybe that doesn't shrink your non-conference options or opportunities. We'll see who's uh, set to rule the roost here the next few years of the Big Ten. Uh, We'll chat about that coming up here at 525. 489-1240, 489-1240, or 800-825-5865. Podcast uh, is where you can find the show on your terms, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Subscribe, like, and uh, give us feedback there uh, if you like. 
Um, uh, Todd emails in. I love hearing from Todd. He was tanning yesterday. Uh, he's like, the running Rebs, they were uh, so much fun to watch. Remember when they went uh, to the Final Four in New Orleans? That was the Armand Gilliam team in 87. And then, uh, yeah, the late 80s, they beat Duke and Mr. Hurley by 30 in Denver. That was Musburger's last hurrah with CBS. And then Duke upset him many years before Elijah was born. Larry Johnson, uh, you have uh, Stacy Ogman, Anthony Hunt. Uh, you have uh, George Eccles. They were they were a party. Yeah. You ever watch any UNLV or, or or Fab Five Michigan stuff? I've watched the Fab Five thirty for thirty. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, uh, they're running rebels not as much. I think they Dude, have- they were they were living their best life. Did they also have a thirty for thirty done on them? They need one. They had some. There, there's what, been what, some. Was it, docu- a, was it some a Netflix docu- docu- docuseries? Is that there, what it there, was? there might be. I don't know. There's something that's been out there, but I mean the the old expose where I mean Tark. If you watched Winning Time with the Lakers, mm-hmm. Tark was supposed to be the head coach instead of Pat Riley. Uh, the Vegas fellas in the desert didn't want Tark leaving uh, UNLV <laughs> for whatever reason. And then I just remember getting Sports Illustrated, RIP Sports Illustrated, in the mail. And, and one of the features was uh, Augman and Larry Johnson in a hot tub with some known... Uh, gamblers and uh, those guys almost went unbeaten their their junior year they came back for a senior season and those guys i think were juco's so they were they could have been one and done they came back to try and, and win it all and they got beat by duke which was heart-wrenching that sucked and then uh tark went away got to meet tarkadian he's close with doc sadler And Tark ended his career at Fresno State. Fresno State played Nebraska. God, was that uh, Amir's freshman year? The kickoff return game? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm standing there going uh, potty, and uh, and, then Tark's standing next to me. (laughs) Hey, Tark, what's up, man? Uh, I waited until we were washing hands to say hello. Uh, We'll say uh, goodbye for this hour. Elijah, you're, you're grinning at me. Uh, next I didn't hour, joke, but it's too late now. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh-huh. Hour two, on the way, Evan Bland coming up with Hale Varsity. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Thanks for hanging. It's Hour 2 at Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Out of the uh, stream come several UNLV fans. <laughs> Uh, pretty good. Uh, Moonbot, uh, Eric, uh, we somehow got on the topic of UNLV with the, the email, which was great. Uh, we will have just incredible behind the scenes, Shannon Sharp, Johnny Football, Bag Man Talk next segment. It's, a, it's about a three minute clip of uh, life pre NIL in the SEC. Incre- just nuts. So we'll we'll have that coming up. We are excited to spend time with Evan Bland, and, and Omaha World Herald, spe- joins us. Speaking of behind the scenes, here's welcome Evan to the show. I was telling him right as I put him online, I was worried because I look into the studio and you're nowhere to be found. The intro is playing. I'm like, where on earth is Schmitty? I'm getting, I'm getting it dubbed and I'm getting it edited and I'm uh, making sure there's no Johnny Football f bomb so we can come to work tomorrow. We have the, the, the dump button. I, I know, but, you know, Which Evan, so, I'm, I'm sometimes just, works. it's just due diligence, Evan. How are we doing? Hanging in. Yeah, I want to hear some of that bag man talk. It's harder to know if it was more unregulated 10 years ago or more so now, but uh, the stories are outstanding for they, sure. They are, and they all kind of started 40 plus. I mean, they started way before that, but you had the, the payroll to meet, right, with SMU and Eric Dickerson and his maroon Trans Am that A&M bought him allegedly. Uh, and he ended up going to SMU and old UNLV Ron Meyer finding his way down to to, to Southern Methodist and 
uh, on and on you go uh, with teams that eh, will put you on probation. But really the bombshell dropped uh, when it comes to football and teams getting sliced off at the knees was SMU. And then even in the old Big 8, Evan, you remember, I think you're you're uh, old enough to remember some really good Oklahoma and Oklahoma State teams and even Texas A&M where all of them went after Hartley Dykes. Oklahoma State got him, kind of the 2.0 version of Irving Fryer. And mm-hmm. what's hilarious is uh, to, to you know Nebraska fans is both of them, uh, Hartley Dykes and Oklahoma State, two-year TV ban. That was right after the Barry Sanders Heisman two-year TV ban for Oklahoma. Some of us had to pody up to watch Nebraska-Oklahoma on pay-per-view, for God's sake, in 89. <laughs> and, and then A&M got popped. <laughs> A&M's, you know, the, the last time they were on TV for a two-year stretch was the uh, kickoff classic against Nebraska, you know, before the end of the season, Texas game. But wild times, man. I mean, it's – that is a great question. Is it wilder now or is it wilder then? I would go then because it was illegal. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, just so many great stories out of that time. And now you see, you know, players like taking pictures proudly in front of their Stack leased cash. automobiles or in their luxurious furnishings or whatever. It's just strange to see it so far out in the open. And in some ways it feels, you know, quaint 20 years ago to kind of see what teams got in trouble for because now it's all legal. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's wild stuff. Well, I remember I showed my my roommate, Alex, who is not the biggest college sports fan, huge Packers fan, has never really gotten into college sports. I don't know how I live with him, but I I digress. I showed him the the 30 for 30, the pony excess, Mm -hmm. and he was like, oh, they paid a player's rent? Who cares? Why was this such a big story? That's the thing is it was under the table, so it was more scandalous, but you compare it to now where it's like, oh, yeah, he's got an NIL valuation of $1.4 million, and he's going to leave college with his retirement taken care of. That is awesome, though. I mean, think about that. Think about being a 22-year-old that you're set for life and potentially you have family members now set. If you, if you, if you financially plan it correctly, whether you play a down or throw a pitch or shoot a basketball at the next level. Uh, in the, well, in the pro and, world. And, and we're getting to the point too, guys. And I'll be curious, like as NIL becomes more entrenched and, and, you know, it, it, I guess more of the norm, like just the dynamic of being a college kid and you're making six figures and seven, eight years ago, you're, you're ready to be done with football. So you can go to the professional level or you can make it, you know, have a, make a living, have a regular career. And now you're going to have guys who are used to making six figures uh, maybe they don't have an NFL career after that. And then you have to go and just like work a regular job and maybe make, you know, half or a fraction of what you're making in college. It's just, it's the paradigm shift is just crazy. I'll be really fascinated to see how that kind of plays out too. That old non-football job interview. Well, I made this much in college. <laughs> well, son, we're going to start you out at 41 with benefits. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, what did you make at your previous job? Yeah, you know, four hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's probably not going to translate into the real world whenever you're done. That's it's just. I mean, someday I want to talk to guys who went through transitions like that because it's just opposite of what it's always been. And I wonder if we ever someday reach a point that guys say they get to the end of their college career, and, and right now we're not at this point by any means, but you reach a point where a guy says, I made the money I wanted to make off I'm my good. college football career. I'm not going pro football. I'm not going to go destroy my body for the next decade. Whenever I have, again, as we kind of talked about, my retirement's taken care of. I got my 401k all loaded up. I'm just going to go work a regular job for 30 years, retire early, and go travel the world with good health. You, you wonder if we're ever going to reach that point, but it's kind of an aside here. Well, here's the, here's the window, and I don't think anybody will ever take the NFL down. They're too big to fail. They're incredible. Look at the TV numbers. Look at the contracts. But it is a non-guaranteed sport in the most uh, vicious league, despite uh, the, the safety attempts. I mean, you can't breathe on, on the quarterback without getting a flag anymore. I was watching video last night. Troy Aikman got smoked by some defensive lineman from the Cardinals circa 1989. Aikman not only got ear holed, but then full body weight body slammed and delivered a perfect pass for a touchdown. Well, you fast forward to now. Yeah, if there's a competing league that will guarantee contracts that are somewhat comparable, 
<laughs> Good luck with that startup money. You know, there, there's your there's your window to challenge the NFL. You're going to have spring football that has four major TV deals now. Four networks are going to be putting on, you know, the Rocks League. Uh, but I don't know, just kind of a, a fun spitball exercise. Thank you, Johnny Football, for the gift that keeps on, on giving. And I texted you during the break. Like, Johnny Manziel, his saga, as we learn more and more, it feels like on a monthly basis about Johnny Football's football career, that story just gets more insane. And he was the talk of college football for three he years. He was fun, man. There was so much more that, that there was yet to be uncovered about Johnny Football. It's just incredible. Like, going to look back, I think, personally, whenever I get to be an old man on Johnny Football as being some of the most fun college football ever was, just because of what he did on the field and then all the information we've gotten off the field mm. since. Well, uh, let's uh, keep it within the football family and talk Nebraska. And, and you know how Johnny Manziel, he redshirted and then won the job at a and uh, There's a, a high chance, probably a, a great chance, Dylan Raiola, Evan, doesn't redshirt. And, you know, what... What can we talk about with, with Dylan? Can he have, and I'm not saying Heisman uh, this early, uh, but you know what? <laughs> wait, 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 check yourself. <laughs> well, I'm not saying Heisman yet. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking, you know, what, what kind of impact do you expect? And we were talking with Babbers about this earlier. Can you expect from, from Nebraska, say they go with the true freshman, either of them, uh, versus – uh, a harbor we got to keep uh, the, the race open right but we all kind of think all right dylan's got the skill set to be the dude and and you know coach rules talked about m- making sure the whoever the quarterback is is ready and i love that approach and uh good good that that's got to be the rule that said uh yeah you have a, a kid in in riola that's super gifted you know what what could this freshman year look like yeah, I mean, it's a, an interesting question. Like, I, you know, I, I've talked with my colleagues. You look at some mm-hmm. of the star quarterbacks in, across college football that have emerged over the years. Typically, <clears throat> those guys don't do it right away. Maybe they do it the second half of their freshman years. Maybe they do it after a redshirt year, and then they take off. It's a different situation in Nebraska where there is no – obvious incumbent. I mean, you have Heinrich Harburg who started eight games, but in a lot of ways he's as new to the position as a true freshman just because uh, you know, the previous staff didn't really consider him part of the plans and all the rest. And so, you know, the situation is absolutely there for him to earn the job. Uh, even days like today, I'm sure as Nebraska is going through conditioning and, and mat drills and you're kind of finding out who's the leader, who accepts uh, good enough, who's pushing the standard to a higher level, who's emerging as a leader, all that stuff is is playing out now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's obvious there's opportunity there for Nebraska. I think the schedule really lines up well. I mean, you, you think about if this was a year ago and you think, okay, Dylan Rail is going to be the guy in your first game's at Minnesota and your second game's at Colorado. Like, that would be a much different situation. I think the perspective would be different than what it is this year where you get UTEP at home. You don't leave, you know, the state until late September and that's at Purdue. So like, it's a very manageable sort of on ramp into college football and, and learning the speed and <clears throat> kind of knowing what you want to do. So I think all that absolutely plays in Nebraska's favor. And then you add just the, the talent that he has, the fact that uh, his upbringing included being surrounded by former professional athletes, including a lot of former NFL quarterbacks because of who his dad was and who his dad snapped footballs to. So I think all, you add all that together and, um, you know, Raiola has as good a chance as anybody as a true freshman to come in and, and take that job and run with it. But, you know, again, you got you to gotta earn it. It's going to start now. It's going to continue through spring ball, and we'll see how it all progresses. But, I mean, all signs are pointing to a guy who has the intangibles and the ability to handle it pretty quickly. Over the next six months or so, Evan, <laughs> with Raiola, how do you balance the, the expectations with what he's actually going to be able to put on the field, what we're actually going to be able to see? I guess my question to you is, will we be able to accurately evaluate his performance through spring football and up through fall cape as we await game one whenever you consider the expectations that are going to be on, on, on Dylan Ryle through this spring and, and through summer, him being the expected starter for this job? How do you balance that? Well, you know, it's... It's interesting because, like, the spring, it's going to be about him and the quarterback position, but it's also going to be about the offense and how different 
the offense is going to look from what it was. It's going to be about Glenn Thomas getting up to speed with uh, not just Raiola, but Daniel Kalen and Heinrich Harburg and what the coaching staff wants to do. I mean, Glenn Thomas spoke with uh, media last month or earlier this month about uh, starting at page one of the playbook. So, like, they're still to the like more or less in the conceptual stages of like, okay, what if what do our quarterbacks do well? How can we put them in the best position to succeed? And then what plays sort of go with that? So, you know, it, it's a different situation than like what's going on on the defensive side, where you have a pretty good sense of what Nebraska is about. You have a pretty good sense of who's back. There are so many variables on the offensive side now, not just with the coaching staff reconfiguration, but also the guys around Riola. I mean, you're going to have new receivers out, out wide. You're going to have a new uh, running back in the mix and Dante Dowdell. Um, you, you just have so many variables that I think the spring is as much about uh, the intangible stuff. It's as much about what does the offense look like in more of a global perspective uh, than just what Dylan Rail is doing. And so I, I think the other part of that then becomes – if you're the the coaching staff, how long do you feel like the quarterback battle needs to go? I mean, there have been years where Nebraska is essentially named a starter by the end of spring ball, and then we've seen years where it doesn't happen until the week of a game. So at what point do you figure that out? I know there's there's value, the coaches have said, in naming that guy sooner than later so they can sort of assume that leadership role and take over. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's just going to be up to those quarterbacks, I think, to a point at least, um, about how long this battle is going to go before somebody is named. Evan Bland's with us from the Omaha World. Harold at Evan Bland, OWH. Evan, couple of minutes here. Going to switch gears to baseball. Our friend Brian uh, in on the, uh, the uh, stream uh, asking who's going to be at third base. And once your take on Cristo on the Hill tomorrow, uh, hit that for us here. If time permits, we might have to carry you over for two minutes on the other side. We're going to get your, your baseball outlook here early on. But thoughts on Cristo, thoughts on third. Yeah, Cristo, you know, fourth career start coming up. He was out of the pen last weekend, uh, still getting built up from an arm strength perspective. It's going to be a challenge, man. I mean, Grand Canyon is no joke with what they do offensively. They have lineup depth. And, you know, they, they like Chris, though. They like his intangibles, clearly, his stuff. But I think the bugaboo that sort of held him back in his career, we saw it a little bit in Texas last weekend, was the command. A little bit, of, a couple walks, uh, I think maybe a wild pitch or a hit batter, but not quite maybe up to what his standard would be or Nebraska coaches' standards would be for that. So I think a successful start for him would be, four or five innings, if you can get through that and you give up maybe a couple of runs and your team's in the game and you hand it over to the bullpen, that'd be a good place to start. You know, as far as third base, it's a bummer with Josh Overbeek with the broken finger. I mean, he was the best hitter Nebraska had last weekend. He was getting on base. I uh, think he had a steal. He was a switch hitter. And so in his absence, you're going to see probably some Dylan Huft, who's a junior college transfer, maybe some Rhett Stokes, who's another junior college transfer. Those guys are both high average above average speed guys. Um, you know, Huft was one of the third base starters in the red white series last fall. So I imagine he'd probably get first crack, but uh, Ben Columbus is somebody else who's a catcher who could also play some third sort of like Luke Roskam could a few years ago. So they have options over there. I think you're going to keep Dylan Carey at short after he moved over from third last year. Um, but, but you might just see a couple different players in there as they kind of figure out who can fill in for a few weeks. Evan, give us two minutes on the other side. Is that okay? You got it. All right, a couple more minutes. Evan Bland, a little overtime Wednesday edition. It's Hail Varsity, and we're powered by Cornhead Lager. Hail Varsity Radio is live. Now, back to Schmitty. Schmitty's a great guy, but he don't have a brain. And Elijah. You want me to speak? We're not pointing you yet. On Hail Varsity Radio. Rolling through a Wednesday here. It's Hail Varsity Radio, powered by Cornhead Lager. Elijah Herbal and Chris Schmidt with you on a Wednesday. We carry on with Evan Bland from the Omaha World Herald talking some Husker baseball. And Evan, as we roll through into segment two here, give me a, a quick thought on this Grand Canyon team because quietly, you look at their start to the season, it's been pretty impressive. They've been putting up runs, in a pretty good clip. You have four wins over some Power 5 teams. They've already taken down Georgetown, USC, BYU, and Ohio State on the year. Whenever you look at all of that, 
this Grand Canyon team is not a team, despite the the name value not necessarily being there, that this Husker baseball team can overlook. Yeah, not at all. I mean, first you look a little bit big picture. This is a team that's favored in the WAC to win the title again. They've done that, uh, you know, most of the last decade. They just renovated their field uh, a few years ago. It's one of the better ones on the West Coast. And so it's a team, it's a program that's invested in baseball for sure. Um, and yeah, this, the team last year was really balanced. They limit their walks on the mound. They strike guys out. They find different ways to score. They're good defensively. I mean, they're just a sound, balanced team. And, you know, the, the pitchers that they're putting out there, there are a couple of freshmen that are going Saturday and Sunday that they feel like could be future aces. Uh, the guy that they're throwing against Christo on Thursday, Daniel Avitia, is a legitimate ace. He's a future <clears throat> major league prospect, so that's going to be uh, tough sledding out of the gate for Nebraska. And then uh, just a really balanced offense, too. I think um, you know anyone who, who follows college baseball a little bit might know the name Zach Yorkey, who's a 295-pound left-handed hitting first baseman. So you know a guy like that's going to jump out at you. He walks more than he strikes out. So like. Uh, they, they have they have dudes, man, and and so as much of a challenge as the first weekend was with some old Big Twelve South friends, um, Grand Canyon is sort of this modern, um, you know, modern college football power, and it's it's a team absolutely you can't overlook. And quite honestly, it's a it's a great opportunity for Nebraska. You're talking about from an RPI perspective, true road games that really add weight to. Uh, what you're wanting to put together, um, and it's a team that's going to finish with a winning record that's going to have a, a strong season of its own. So big opportunity and a big challenge for Nebraska for sure. Evan uh, got in late to the re- to the start of this segment, uh, the Johnny football drop in a moment, but <laughs> real quick thought on on just Will and and, and Rob's take on this first weekend. If, if that's been asked, both of you yell at me. If not, no, we're good. No, so are they pleased with with how things went despite the one and two start? Yeah, I think so. And you know, even the players, like I think they they kind of doubled down on how good they can be, even though they lost a couple of games in the ninth inning. And to me, you just have to look under the hood just a little bit, and you can see a lot of promising signs. I think one offensively. Uh, you know, you hit under 200 with runners in scoring position. Even an average team in college baseball over time is going to hit closer to 250. So you, you figure that's going to come around at least a little bit. And Nebraska hit some hard balls to, uh, you know, right at infielders that just didn't work out uh, that may have flipped the game. I mean, that's how thin that margin was. And then on the mound, uh, you know, Will Bolt, Rob Childress have said one statistic they most closely correlate with winning is your strikeout to walk ratio. And a year ago at this time, it was like one to one. It was like 18 to 18 and that's not good. And this year, I think it's 28 to 11 right now. So you're striking out 28 guys, you're walking 11, you're still figuring out your bullpen rolls. I think it's worth noting that 15 Huskers made their Nebraska debuts this weekend. So as much as you can kind of gauge from a player in summer ball and in fall workouts, like you still don't really know until the lights come on against another college opponent. And so I think they learned a lot last weekend about who they can uh, put in different spots, maybe what the, some of those bullpen roles will be. And now you're going to have this weekend too, where uh, that depth tested even more over four games instead of three against another good opponent. Um, but I think they're they're that much closer to kind of figuring out, you know, and piecing together what that pitching can look like. I've just thought of an analogy, Evan. I want to get your thoughts on if it's accurate for where this Husker baseball team is at and where we're at in our analysis of them. I feel like this team is like buying a classic car off of eBay. You get it shipped to you. It looks pretty good. Look at you and the trust you have online. No, no. Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you brought in a lot of additions here. I don't want to call them sight unseen, but you don't know how they're going to work together. But the win against Will Baylor. They run? The, the win against <laughs> Baylor is the car at least turned over. The first time you put the key in the ignition, you turn on it, turns over. You take it out for the drive. It's driving good. You have some problems at stoplights. That's Texas Tech. That's Oklahoma. You got a week to get it back and, and working. Obviously, you have to, to replace a, a piece in, in overbeak. You know, that's a piece you got to replace. But you have another chance. Tire. After a, a week of working on it, you have another chance to take it out of the garage. And, and I'm sure there's still going to be some hiccups, but you have a chance to make some progress this weekend against Grand Canyon. Fair? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, there's some, some – yeah, I mean, you can take that analogy a little further and say there are some buttons that – 
maybe they didn't know or that they could push or that some buttons that, uh, is this really the e-brake? Is this really <laughs> the right turn signal? I mean, it looked like it was when it was in the garage. Is it going to work in traffic? And you know, maybe it does. Um, and, and in a few cases, maybe it doesn't. Maybe you have to uh, you know, push a different button in a different situation. And, and I think, honestly, some of those tweaks are going to come on the pitching side mm-hmm. because the lineup more or less stayed the same. And I think it will, again, with the exception of uh, third base, where you're going to have to replace Overbeak. But, uh, you know, it's just a year ago. Like, you think about a year ago and some of the guys who were starting in – mid-February were not starting or even had major roles a month later. So, like, you're still figuring out who's a gamer when the lights are on, when the crowd's out there. Uh, and, and quite honestly, there are guys that didn't even get into games last weekend that I still think could be, you know, key pieces to what Nebraska wants to do. I think Rand Sanders is one who's a transfer from Omaha. I think Ryan Harahill, true freshman, is going to have a big role on this team. I mean, those guys didn't even – get on the mound last weekend. So I, you're still kind of figuring things out. Uh, they, st- I, I still think there's enough talent and depth. And again, over a four game series, like that's when that's really going to show out along with those midweekers is, uh, do you have enough arms to cover those games? Do you have enough offense to, to hang with another pretty good club on the other side? Nebraska feels like it does. Some of the results weren't there, but sort of, again, the, the metrics and the underlying numbers would say that they're actually in a pretty good place. Evan Bland with us from the Omaha World Herald at Evan Bland OWH. Evan, will check in again. We'll send you some of that Johnny football audio. Thanks for, for giving us a little OT today, bud. You got it, guys. Thanks. All right, there he is, Evan Bland with us. So let's uh, hear a little. This snippet's out there in, in, on uh, on Twitter in Shannon Sharp's podcast with Johnny Football. So the, the premise of this uh, two-minute clip, it's pretty entertaining. Uh, with uh, Johnny Football being offered uh, under the table money, Johnny's dad, to uh, to stay, to run it back, not to go to the NFL draft. But my dad went and had a meeting with Kevin Sutman and pretty much went to him man to man and was like, we'll take three million bucks and we'll stay for the next two years. And my dad says this is true as true as today as he did when he told me. He left. He did the same thing that he did when Cliff Kingsbury asked him to be the highest paid offensive coordinator the year before. Mm-hmm. And Cliff would have stayed with me another year and we would have ran it back and right. gone for another one. Right. But he comes to someone, he asks him for X amount, someone, pff, he had this ego about him that what we built, we, was all him. Right. And then you start that next year, okay? I leave, decide to go to the NFL. This deal doesn't work. Kevin, someone kind of blows us off. We can do this without you type of vibe. Okay. So the fall comes around 2014 AM football season. Kenny Hill is named our starting quarterback. We win our first five games of the year. We're five and zero. Oh, we're top 10 in the country. I ain't getting no love in the program. Yeah, because I'm thinking, I, re- I remember hearing it, and they talk about uh, Johnny who? Who? Because he had, a, he, I think South he had Carolina, like, five touchdowns, first oh, game of the season. Okay, okay. So you you, you remember hearing it also. I so hold on, I want to make sure, I, wanna, I got a backtrack. Yeah, back it up. You said your dad went to Kevin Sumlin. Yep. And says for $3 million. We're staying for two. <laughs> now, you do realize this is prior to NIL. I agree. This, so this is a, I agree. a <laughs> bag room deal. <laughs> went on for 30, 40 years before. It was the same way that was happening when you was getting recruited back in the day. And you guys, you know, y'all, Texas A&M got money for I mean, Texas A&M, nobody got no money like Texas A&M. Y'all got the big dogs. I ring, baby. Y'all got the big dogs. And so $3 million, if he had gone to any of the boosters and said, you know what? Uh, Johnny Dad said he'll stay for an additional two years. If we just break him off three mil. Just keep it in cash. Throw it somewhere. We'll get it later. We don't need it right now. Right. But for my security, if something happens for two years down the road. Right. And my dad did this without me knowing. And I ain't mad at him about it for right. nothing. It's right. the way the business worked back then. Right. There was a bag man. There was a bag man at LSU. There was a bag man at Bama. There was a bag man at every school. Right. Relationship anymore with him anymore. We'll reach out and talk like here and there, maybe once a year, mm-hmm. but not like I have the relationship with my other coaches. And, you know, my gut instinct and feel is, and I know this because of instances that happened when I left. Man, I mean, that's just, that's Johnny's perspective. The old bag man, he just kind of, 
ro- drove the bus over like like we're not naive to the the fact that this has and could exist it's all well let's prove it well there's more <laughs> corroboration well bama lsu a and m uh three schools right let's uh they all had bag men let's let's go get the top prospect who cares I, if it's illegal i just love how much of a unified front the manzel family had where johnny manzel's out there getting his with autographs and whatnot and then behind the scenes apparently without johnny's knowledge Johnny's dad's going to Kevin Selman saying, we need money. To Didn't th- Johnny's dad, though, get him some sort of advice or I'm trying to remember back to the, the documentary where it was either it was Johnny's grandpa. It's Johnny's grandpa that saved all that money from the autographs and only cost him, what, a half a football? Yeah. <laughs> like the Manziel family. The, I mean, ethics and morals aside. They, they, are, they took care of Johnny. <laughs> they, well, and, and Johnny t- t- took care of them. I mean, he had a $10 million deal with Nike, and he, his agent got him a first-round draft pick. Although Jerry Jones is still, no pun intended, Jones and, Jones and to pick him. That was a good pun. I know it's no pun intended. They, they were trying to pick him uh, with that fourth pick overall, and they went with, went, went, went with Zeke. But this is just fascinating. How just blatant and who cares and... Uh, rarely, I mean, it's not like Alabama, it's not like LSU, it's not like A&M have not been put on probation in the past, but you don't have enough uh, manpower for the NCAA to, to make it stick. But look at someone. I mean, he was painting a pretty tough picture of someone. Someone had the cream of the crop of quarterbacks. I mean, he had, who's the kid um, in, in, in Arizona right now? Oh, uh... Oh, no, you shouldn't have put me on the spot. Well, and I, I put you on the spot because I can remember. But we're talking three or four kids that transferred out of A&M that all end up going and are in the NFL now. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Good stuff from Evan Bland, Mike Babcock. We check in with Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday and uh, baseball season in the air. We spent plenty of time talking Husker baseball, but Dr. Brandon, uh, the Yanks are trying to add another pennant or more as uh, they chase the ring, and Aaron Judge uh, is in the news. Is is He missed a lot of time last year after that magical 62 home run season with that, that busted toe that messed with him all last season and kept him uh, quite uh, often feeling uncomfortable. Dr. Brandon, let's talk about this constant maintenance that Aaron Judge is going to have to deal with, not only this season, but the rest of his career. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Well, hey, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I was looking through kind of where Judge is at. You know, we talked about that injury last year. Um, you know, there was obviously some speculation there about what that was. You know, from my re- what I recall with him, this is more of kind of what we call that plantar plate injury, turf toe type injury. I remember seeing that video, you know, where he hit that kind of uneven piece of ground. I think it was a little extra concrete shelf right there in that outfield wall. And so they nursed us along, obviously missed some games last year. Um, and I can't remember, I can't recall if he underwent a procedure for that. I know they managed, you know, that kind of, you know, conservatively for a while. But essentially, when we talk about this anatomically, if we're talking about that plantar plate injury, turf toe injury, that involves the you know, essentially your great toe, okay, your first metatarsal, and it's kind of right at that pain point underneath the ball of your great toe, called the uh, MTP joint, metatarsal phalangeal joint, and there's a real thick ligamentous structure that runs along the bottom side of that. It really gives you essentially all that kind of support that you need over the bottom or plantar aspect of that foot. And also, as you think about it, as you kind of roll up on your toes and then push off, that's really where that kind of forms its or serves its major function. And that's essentially where that injury was for him. It's Dr. Brandon Seifert with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. A Jock Doc Wednesday talking Aaron Judge as uh, he apparently is going to need constant maintenance on his big toe, maybe throughout the rest of his career following that injury he sustained, tracking down a fly ball last summer. And, Dr. Brandon, what does he mean by constant maintenance on that big toe? Because whenever I think about it, like if I had a big toe injury and I was trying to, to keep it from hurting, I'd avoid coffee tables or other things that I could jam my toe into. But I think it means more for a professional athlete. What, what does that mean whenever he says this big toe is going to require constant maintenance? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever you're treating these, whether it's you treat it surgically, you're treating it non-operatively, you know, this is a, a really kind of stressed 
area. You think about the amount of force that goes to that area. Even a surgical reconstruction, there still is some maintenance that kind of goes along with that. Um, you know, despite data kind of on both sides of the coin here about how well these things do, whether you treat non-op versus surgically, these always tend to be a problem, and you have to kind of manage them in terms of symptoms. So despite all the different types of treatments have out there, patients still tend to struggle a little bit with these, uh, whether it's just pain. Sometimes it's more significant where maybe they don't quite have the same push-off strength. And so as we talk about maintenance with him, there's a couple of things you can do for these. You know, whether you're talking about special inserts for your shoes, that's probably about the most about the easiest thing you could do where it essentially stiffens up that area so there's less of that kind of force, flexion force going through it. Um, you can also do some specialized taping techniques. Uh, it may be a deal where you have to you know, change the way you're doing your kind of off-season workouts just to take away some of that kind of abuse to the area. We talked about a lot of these high-level athletes, some type of maintenance program for them where maybe their practice schedule is a little bit different to try to give them more miles in their career. So those would be just some things you could do. The things you'd want to avoid in this scenario would be lots of, you know, kind of steroid shots into the area that can further degrade the tissue. And so that would not be a great long-term management strategy. Uh, but you could think about some of those other injections we've discussed, like the PRPs, the stem cells. That could be a, a reasonable kind of maintenance option on top of, obviously, some of your occasional anti-inflammatories to the area. Guy still hit 37 bombs last year with that bad big toe. And I just think about his stance, his power, and how important your feet are as a power hitter and just a hitter in general. I'm throwing out the, the defensive side <laughs> because, well, I, mean, he's, I mean, it's not that he's not, you know, a freak of nature at 6'7", 285, roaming uh, the outfield. But you don't put Aaron Judge in your lineup for his defensive prowess. No, thank you. <laughs> you. You made my point there. Yeah. So what's the uh, – let's talk about a look at surgery. Didn't have it. Okay, it's maintenance. Didn't want to mess with it, it doesn't sound like. So Mm -hmm. what is surgery look like, and does it fix it, or is it just a a short-term fix? Is there always going to be an issue? What's what's the prognosis post-surgery? Sure. You know, as we had mentioned, you know, it's kind of tough when you look at some of the uh, studies and things that are out there. Um, I would tell you that the biggest thing is, Long term, we know whether you treat you know, surgically, non-surgically, there's still going to be some kind of issues here. They're still a little bit different as a player. Um, you know, surgically, you probably have a little bit more definitive data in terms of how they do, which you know, still is, is a reasonably high rate of return. Obviously, it's sports-specific. Um, and a baseball player, it's probably still a fairly high rate of return, obviously depending on what position that you're in. If you're talking, you know, surgery for these, it's usually more of what we call a reconstruction. So usually that tissue, you know, especially this far down the road, number one, that tissue in and of itself, when you look at it post-injury, even acutely, it's not amazing tissue to try to sew back together. And so this is usually kind of a reconstructive scenario where you have to either, A, bring in your tissue from elsewhere to basically reconstruct this area, um, maybe sliding some tissue around nearby that you can essentially kind of rebuild that we call plantar plate structure to give you the support. It's Dr. Brandon Seifert with us here at Jock Doc Wednesday talking Aaron Judge. And Dr. Brandon, Judge is 32 years old, which in some sports means you're getting up there. But in baseball, it means he's still got a lot of good baseball left in you. And I want to get your thoughts with career longevity. Do you have any concerns with a, a toe that maybe will require some maintenance over the next couple of seasons to keep it in good shape? Do you start worrying about that career longevity? Or, or is this kind of the old coachingism of it's a long way from your heart? Yeah, you know, for him, again, I think the big thing would be where they put him. You know, so from a career longevity perspective, I still think he's a guy that is hitting in your lineup lineup for a long time. Um, You know, maybe he's a guy that you take him out from Rome in the outfield and you put him more, you know, more of a stationary place. Maybe he becomes a first baseman down the road. You minimize some of that uh, kind of wear and tear mobility. That's probably a good fit for him down the road if this becomes more of an issue. I still think he's a guy that has a great long career. And uh, I think his prognosis still is pretty pretty solid. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us, Nebraska Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday. And say this maintenance goes well, is there any lingering issue? Uh, okay, so you're able to deal with the pain, you're able to deal with the mobility. About 45 seconds here, Dr. Brandon. Could, could arthritis set in? Uh, what are some of the lingering issues here, discomfort-wise? 
Yeah, absolutely, Chris. That's a great point. You know, arthritis tends to be a big issue here. So this would be more on the order of what we call post-traumatic arthritis. So you have some type of trauma to the area and that kind of initial insult where the cartilage really takes a pretty large contusion or impact definitely develops in this scenario. So he will have some. It just depends on, you know, how quickly this progresses. Uh, that could be, you know, reasonably debilitating for him. Again, I still think you hit pretty well even in that scenario. Uh, but obviously the more arthritis that sets up, kind of the less abilities you have kind of running around the field and kind of that mobility of chasing after balls versus, you know, hitting, you can still kind of manage, I think, adjust your game to deal with that. Dr. Brandon, thanks for the rundown here on Aaron Judge. We're excited to see what he can do this season, and hopefully he can stay healthy. Thanks for the time today. Okay, fellas. You guys take care. All right. There he is, Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday. Good to spend time with him. Steak and a beer bet is next. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Final time, one final time, it's Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. And uh, we will get a steak and a beer bet here momentarily. We'll hear one last thought from Fred. But uh, I want to remind you about uh, getting buckled up. Uh, important to do so. Uh, use your seatbelt. It saves lives. It prevents injuries only if properly worn. Make it click. A message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. Elijah, last thought here from Fred before our steak and a beer. Why it can be different tonight for Nebraska on the road, cut five. Uh, you know, it's kind of been the theme for us. We've lost a couple on the road. We've won a couple at home. You know, you go on the road and you, you drop one. The thing I really like, uh, you know, I thought we played maybe our best game of the year against Illinois on the road, a top, almost top 10 team, and had a chance, had a lead under five seconds to go. So we've had performances where we've given ourselves a chance. Rutgers uh, went into overtime, lost Juwan that game. It was a tough break. It happens in this league. Uh, you know, you just you got to find a way to get one. You got to hopefully get one, give you confidence that you know you can do it, and you know that will make the next one uh, more manageable. So you know, it's it's important for us. The guys know it. They they read all this stuff. They've got unfortunately their phones with them at all times. You know, reading all the commentary and, and what it's going to take to play in March. Um, so you know, it's. Uh, as far as differences, you know, I've liked how we played at home, but I've liked how we played at home all year. It's just a matter of carrying that over to the road. Okay, no drum roll needed. Nebraska, Indiana, does it happen for Nebraska tonight? Is it another setback with a rebound opportunity against uh, Minnesota in an elimination game? You've got a, you know, a, a bubbling bubble scenario here in the Big Ten. Indiana's kind of, sort of. Minnesota for sure. Sparty, Nebraska, Northwestern. I think think Northwestern's played themselves off the bubble. They just won and they keep winning on the road for the most part, or they've fared pretty well. How are you feeling, Elijah? You run into the sports book and taking the two? Definitely not. You're taking taking Indiana tonight. Uh, Well, as I kind of laid it out earlier, the big question tonight with me is, does Indiana roll over, or do they give it fight? Do they play with pride tonight, play for pride tonight? And I look at the stretch that they go on, where you're on the road against Penn State, home against Wisconsin, which Wisconsin seems to be hitting their stride again, on the road against Maryland, on the road against Minnesota, and then back home to finish the year against Michigan State. When I look at those, if I'm Indiana, I see Nebraska as your best chance to go win a basketball game. I think tonight is the night where Nebraska gets the best shot from Indiana. I think it's going to be close all the way through. I think Indiana pulls it out late, and Nebraska's road woes continue. Okay. I am going to, just for fun... Because uh, I would well, not spend your money nor mine betting on Nebraska to win a road game. The thing is, I the, will, the great tradition, the great tradition of the steak and a beer bet is whoever picks first is almost always wrong. So you're doing this with your with your heart versus your head. No, I'm be- I'm I'm going with my head and picking Indiana. Okay, and it's the old hedge bet where you know what? If I'm wrong, it's okay. At least we'll have more fun talking about a sure, Husker win sure. tomorrow. Well, I I am going to say Nebraska handles it. I think Indiana. If Nebraska does not help them hang around, hanging around. I think Nebraska can can put the you know turn their lights out. Well, I think realistically, if if Nebraska gets Indiana's best shot, Nebraska could still go win by ten. Sure, I think Nebraska is that much better. But it, for me, it's the road woes. Until I see something otherwise, I have to expect that the road woes continue. And the best shot from Indiana combined with Nebraska road woes probably would equal an Indiana win. Nebraska eighty, Indiana seventy-seven. 
They get off the schneid. I'll go 76-73 Indiana. Okay, we'll see who's less wrong tomorrow. Talk to you at four. Thanks for tuning in to Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager.